Hey there, Extra Historians. Welcome to Lies, the part of the show where we tell you all the things we left out, the stuff we went wrong, and why sometimes uh, Admiral Ellison needs a hand. I'm Rob. I'm the head writer of Extra History. This is Napoleon in Egypt. I'm not in Egypt. I'm in Thailand. Um, and the reason I am is that uh, I'm here with my friend Mike, uh, who's been my best friend for 10 years in Hong Kong and who is moving to South America. Uh, you know Mike in a weird way. He's behind the camera during our Lies episodes. So thanks, Mike, for uh, helping make Lies possible for all these years and uh, many adventures to come. Uh, the other people that made Lies possible is our patrons. Thank you very much. Uh, we couldn't do this without you, and I love getting this time to talk, uh, just talk about history directly to you and why I made the choices I made and uh, made the missteps I did. We're part of the Nebula First program. It's a really cool by Creators for Creators network. Our episodes premiere there a week early, so if you ever want to see, say, the first episode of the new series before it debuts on YouTube, that's where you go. And uh, you can get your episodes a week early and not have to wait. Uh, recommended reading for this week is Napoleon in Egypt by Juan Cole. This is going to give you all of the, the kind of basics of, uh, of Napoleon's time in Egypt. It's interesting. Um, sort of trailblazing comparisons to uh, more modern Western interventions in the Middle East. Uh, then Mirage, Napoleon Scientists and the Unveiling of Egypt by Nina Burley. This is going to give you all the savant stuff. I highly recommend if you're interested in that, go read this book. It's really good. Uh, we couldn't get into an eighth of all the stuff that's to be talked about there. And it's a, it's a very complicated and fascinating topic. The book is broken down by like one chapter will be about a geologist largely and uh, geological uh, investigations and things like that. Napoleon, A Life by Andrew Roberts. Napoleon. Uh, and The Black Count, Glory, Revolution, Betrayal, and The Real Count of Monte Cristo by Paul Michael. This is such a good book. Go read it. It's about Tamar Alexandre Dumas and all the stuff about him that was in this series comes from there. I would love this to be a stealth introduction of uh, getting people interested in a Tomah Alexandre Dumas uh, series. He's just amazing. Uh, this book is so good. Um, he's, of course, the father of Alexandre Dumas and uh, the novelist of The Three Musketeers and Count of Monte Cristo. And a lot of those uh, adventures are inspired by things his father really did. Um, it's a very tragic and interesting story. In general, one thing that surprised me is we don't have a lot of Egyptian sources on this period. We have Al Jabarti, the chronicler, who we talk about in the series, and that's kind of it. And he's a very like elite, top-down uh, look at this, so we don't necessarily see a lot of what's going on on the street. And I would I would love if some sources emerged or were translated that that give us that. But uh, as a result, we had to spend a lot more time with the French than I really wanted to going into it. But that's just how things, how things worked out. Patron question from English teacher Stephen. Uh, Talleyrand, this is the French foreign minister, somehow managed to smoothly slide into top positions under the revolution, Bonaparte, and the Bourbons again. While all around him were losing their heads. How'd he do it? Now, I picked this to answer. It's not so much Napoleon in Egypt, but I picked it to answer because uh, Talleyrand is involved in all this stuff because he's sending diplomats to the court of the Ottoman Sultan saying like, hey, we took over Egypt, but this is good for both of us, right? So uh, we're just going to administer Egypt, and we'll give you all these rice shipments. And just don't try and take it back, okay? It was kind of semi-independent under the Mamluk Bays anyway. This will be better for both of us. Does not go so well. Uh, but I don't know. This question sounded like a request for a series on Talleyrand. That would be very interesting. Even today, historians are kind of divided on him. Some see him as a cynical power player who's just happy to betray anyone to anyone else, uh, so long as he stays in power. Others see that as a pragmatic way to keep a steady hand on you know, foreign policy during this very chaotic period. I don't know. That would be interesting to explore at some point. Episode 1, patron question, Joshua Evans Lowell. Who's on the far right at 553? Charles VI of France wasn't a crusader. This is the... Um, uh, uh, Charles the Beloved and Charles the Mad from our Joan of Arc series. As far as I know, the most notable French crusader king in Egypt was Louis IX, who got his ass kicked by Charles Aldur. Yeah, so this is uh, kind of a multi-layered mistake. Charles was originally put in there, I think, as, as a um, uh, placeholder, and then the model would be changed to 
be a more generic uh, French king, but then that didn't happen. It's indeed supposed to be either a generic king or Louis IX. I was going to talk about Louis IX in, uh, in Lies anyway. Basically, yeah, we kind of look at, back at him as a big failure as a crusader, but he uh, you know, became a saint. He was a very heavily religious king and became the sort of ideal of like a, a French crusader Christian king. So um, to the French during Napoleon's time, he's this ideal you want to be like, whereas we look at him and we're just like, really, you want to be like that guy? He just went there and kind of died. And by the way, they've now done like investigations on his jawbone, and it looks like he might have died from scurvy. I don't know how you do that in Tunisia. It's really famous for oranges and citrus fruit, but apparently that played a factor, at least was part of a, the, at least a factor in his death. Patron question, flubba dubba. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. The funniest part about how the French reacted to Alexandria is that there's actually a modern psychological diagnosis reserved for people who have the same reaction to Paris, uh, especially the Japanese, since so much of Japanese media romanticizes the city. Yeah, I, I live in Hong Kong, and we have we get a lot of Japanese products, and a lot of them are like branded as Paris. You know, my my four-year-old daughter will go into a shop and grab a bunch of Japanese stickers off a shelf, and they'll be Paris themed, and be like, "Daddy, I want I want these." these cool, like, nice pink stickers, and it'll just be this Paris-themed set. So yeah, I, I could see that happening. Patron question from Brian Rose. Fun fact, the noted landing at Malta was essentially the reason that Tsar Paul aligned Russia against France, which is pretty much how we got the War of the Second Coalition. Yeah, another big, big factor was the Ottomans being furious about Egypt. Um, so yeah, Talleyrand doesn't, kind of floods it in there. The diplomats just get nowhere when they show up. And the Ottomans are like, no, that's ours. Are you kidding me? We're not just going to let you have it. And speaking of the Mamluks, a YouTube question, just a minor correction. We repeatedly refer to Mamluk sultans in this episode. The Mamluk Sultanate was conquered by the Egyptians in 1517, some 280 years before Napoleon set foot in Egypt. Mamluks were slave professional knights and a ruling aristocracy. Uh, and ruling Egypt would have been impossible without their help, so the Ottomans kept their aristocracy under the leadership of a bey, which is a like local governor. Uh, who was also subservient to the Ottoman governor, the Pasha. Egypt was still under the Ottoman Empire uh, as a province at the time. Yes, this is absolutely right. Um, they were sort of semi-independent at that point, at least is how the books I read described it, and occasionally would refer to themselves as sultans, particularly in the uprisings that we talked about in episode, uh, episode four. Um, they had rebelled fairly recently. They were always a little bit kind of slipping the leash. And uh, I think just we, we had talked about the Mamluk Sultan, Sultan having done things that diminished Egypt, and that goes back to you know the time of the Black Plague in the 1200s. So um, that's why things had started to crumble. Someone said Napoleon didn't randomly conquer Malta and just leave. He spent time there, wrote a whole new constitution. The time he spent there was a real detriment to his journey, but it shows he did actually care and didn't just conquer it for conquest's sake. We circled back to this in episode four, yeah, there's a period Napoleon is in Malta and is putting forth reforms to religion, to uh, the judiciary, uh, the state, that kind of thing. Um, he did pretty much the same thing everywhere he conquered. He's not just there to do that, though. He's also really afraid of the Royal Navy. So Malta had to be conquered because otherwise it would theoretically block his lines of communication and supply back to France, right? And so he wants it to be safely held in French, uh, French control. Um, so it's, it's partially like he does want to do these, these kind of revolutionary ideal things, enlightenment ideal things, but it's also good, good military sense to kind of like make sure that he's got a lock on it. And also he's hiding there to a certain extent. Uh, it's genuinely unbelievable how close these two fleets came to running into each other. The British actually cite the French at one point and just think it's a British patrol, and then they end up going the wrong way. They're like, oh, well, those guys have been over there and we haven't gotten any signals that the French are over there, so I guess we'll go this way. Um, it's real Patrick O'Brien stuff, you know, like douse all the lights at night, nobody speaks aboard so that the enemy can't hear you. Um, as we mentioned, a British ship arrives in Alexandria 24 hours before the French arrive. We had a lot of interest in, uh, and a lot of questions and comments about uh, Tamar Alexandre Dumas. All I'm saying is go read The Black Count. It's fantastic. I could spend a lot of time 
talking about him that would just be concluding with, go read The Black Count. It's a great book. It's on Audible if, if you like reading that way. Episode two, patron question from Moinas Me. You mentioned that one of Napoleon's messages said that he had come to raise the true worship of Muhammad. Was that a mistake on your end, or did he really not know that Muslims don't worship Muhammad? Napoleon, when he arrived, was not very familiar with Islam. Uh, his religious language and thinking was steeped in Catholicism. That began, I mean, you know, that changed the longer he stayed in Egypt. Um, he didn't really understand very much about Egypt at all. He had talked to a very prominent traveler who had been there a long time, and that kind of raised his idea of, of invading Egypt. But that same guy was specifically like, don't invade Egypt, that's not going to go well. And, uh, you know, it's really amazing just how little the French knew. There was information out there, but they didn't really seek it out very much. They knew so little about Egypt when they went. Um, and uh, it, it's sort of shocking in retrospect. Uh, there were French communities there that, that they could have read books by, but they just really didn't. Napoleon himself was pretty a-religious. He could fake it if he needed to. He liked religion as a tool of social control. He was less anti-religious than most uh, revolutionaries were. Patron question from uh, Thomas Charbonnel. Wikipedia French and English mention Murer, but don't mention that he committed suicide. They say he strayed away from the rest of the soldiers and got himself killed. What's your source for the suicide claim? Napoleon's Egypt uh, talks about the suicide claim. There are French officers that write about this and say that this cover story that Murer walked off and uh, got killed by the Bedouins. Uh, some believe it, some don't. I went with the suicide because it makes more sense to me. It was very clear at this point that if you walked off by yourself, you were going to get killed by the Bedouin um, and or get captured and sexually assaulted, which is something that happens to a lot of French officers who get traded back. Um, and uh, so I just don't see him going off, especially not toward the Nile, but like into the desert and behind a bunch of dunes where he can't be seen. It just doesn't make any sense to me why he would do that unless he was intentionally trying to either kill herself, himself or be killed. Um, so I went with that, but I always plan to talk about it in lies because yeah, if you look at Wikipedia, it says that he was killed by the Bedouin. Um, but it's much more, there, there, there are other theories that I think have better support personally. Uh, patron question, Joshua Evans Lowell. At 133, art note for lies. Nelson should only have one hand as he lost his right arm at the Battle of Santa Cruz de Tenefre the previous year. Also, Tamal Alexandre Dumas definitely needs a one-off episode or special mention in Lies. Oh boy, this one. So, I'm not really sure what happened with this. I do know that the photo I uploaded to our, um, our image gallery for, for the stuff definitely has Nelson with one arm. I might have missed his hand on the telescope. I, or in shaking hands, sorry or I just misremembered when he lost his arm. Um, he is also holding that, that telescope to his right eye, which was blind. I thought this was like a cute little reference because there's this famous thing uh, at, at uh, Siege of Copenhagen where he pretends not to see a naval signal by holding the telescope up to his right eye and is like, I don't see any order, you know? And uh, this is supposedly the origin of turning a blind eye. So I'm like, oh, that's a good, good, good way to um, bring that up in lies. Um, but I also just, I guess, missed this hand on the telescope. It's a little hard because our characters don't have arms. They just have hands. So uh, occasionally we'll miss something like that. And then we fixed it for episode two. It's too late for episode one when people point out. We fixed it for episode two. And then I didn't realize he was a background character in episode four. So he has the hand again. So it's his appearing, disappearing hand. Uh, YouTube question. The way Admiral Nelson almost never stars in his history videos, but is frequently mentioned, it makes him feel like a force of nature. I really want to do a Nelson series. I think that would be fantastic. I think he's amazing. My dad was really obsessed with Nelson. I've been to the victory. I almost went a second time when I was in the UK. Um, if, uh, I think it was Trafalgar was on the vote. And if that had gone through, I, I would have gone to, taken a day to go to the victory again. Um, I do want to mention that he's not very popular among one group, which is the U.S. Marine Corps. If you go to a former formal Marine banquet, uh, they will have a little uh, section where they say, at this time, if you would like to, you may shed a, shed a tear for Lord Admiral Nelson. That is the cue for everyone to use the restroom. Um, so I've, I've always thought that was funny. Uh, little, little 
dig from uh, the the French and Indian War or um, uh, 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 War of eighteen twelve era. You should mention more details about the Mamluks, not just how they'd been around and how they fought the last major battle against the Mongols. They also endured Mansa Musa, Tamerlane, the Ottomans, and the French, and then finally died. Yeah, one of the weaknesses of this series is I kept pushing off talking about like getting into the whole Mamluk thing. We do mention them in our Ibn Battuta series, by the way. Um, and then they ended up, it ended up becoming sort of peripheral in, in episode four, uh, or episode three, when we finally got there. We took a more deep look at the recent history of the Mamluks. They're very interesting. They could get, we could do a whole series out of, on them, honestly. Episode three, patron question from Ahmad Damian. Why was Alazar Mosque in the series pronounced Alazir? I know that foreign pronunciation is difficult, but it completely doesn't resemble Alazar. I apologize for this one. It was said in the, it, when I listened to the books talking about it, it was said Alazar. I looked up a, an official Arabic pronunciation and it was more Alazir. And I sent that to Matt. And, um, and so that was my mistake, finding a, a bad, um, a bad example to send. YouTube question. The sound effects for the naval battle were really awesome. The visuals were also really cool. Yeah, uh, Nick Pet pulled out of the stops for that sequence. I thought it was really great. Um, there's a big question on, or big comment on the Battle of the Nile and explaining what went on. I'm not going to get into that because I intentionally swerved the Battle of the Nile a little bit so that if we do a Nelson series in the future, we can come at it fresh. Um, I would really like to do a Nelson series at some point. I think that would be great. But I do want to mention this story about like the French captain with one arm and no legs being put in a bucket of wheat so that he can be still commanding his ship. Uh, there are times when I'm reading and I immediately go like, oh, that's a, that's a, that is absolutely a, um, uh, an intro. And that's one of them. Oh, it's from a book I forgot to mention. That's from the Osprey uh, Battle of the Nile, 1798. That's also we used for that, for this series. Episode four, patron question, Brian Rose. Oh, you didn't even mention Napoleon's arch nemesis, Sir Sidney Smith. Yes, this is a Royal Marine commander who's like the coordination point between the British and the Ottomans. Uh, his story is very interesting. We didn't have time for him, really. He's the one who sends the newspaper through the lines at the siege to, to tell Napoleon to basically scare Napoleon into raising the siege. He's a really interesting guy. He does all sorts of clever kind of prank, almost like prank war things um, on Napoleon, psychological warfare stuff. He might raid a one-off sometime. Um, but yeah, I, now that I know that everyone is so interested in him, I will definitely put him on, on the list for a one-off at least. A YouTube question. Uh, we talked about some of the anger in the Cairo revolt being about Egyptian women going to parties with French officers and drinking wine going unveiled and that sort of thing. I just wanted to unpack that a little. Why Kyrene seemed to be upset about this is that they were high class women, right? They were wives of Ottomans who were off fighting in the desert, um, who seemed to have, have uh, deserted them, or they were, uh, you know, women from, from uh, harems, but they were high class, or they were daughters of prominent families, especially. And this is really what caused the anger that they were, you know, drinking wine, going unveiled, you know, going to parties with French officers. And some of them might not have felt like they had a choice. Some of them might have been trying to hitch their star to the winning side. Some of them maybe were experimenting with new freedoms. But like this probably didn't end well for them. Only um, Nu's wife gets taken back to France. Like other Egyptian women end up getting left there. I mean, the savants end up having to find their own way back, basically, like even they get cut off. So, um, you know, you wonder what happened to them. Probably, uh, probably some rough times, you know, this is kind of a normal um, thing is that when, when uh, women end up having relationships with men from an occupying army, uh, and then that occupying army leaves, uh, they, you know, there are reprisals. Um, so there were probably some some of those, and you have to wonder what happened to them. Um, I do want to mention like this idea. I wanted to get into this more because I think it's really interesting. This idea that the French had that we're all going to get Egyptian mistresses. It's going to be like Antony and Cleopatra. Very quickly they realize that this is not going to happen, and the reason is it's not going to happen is even when they do get Egyptian women to agree to like come to parties with them and whatever. There's a huge language barrier, like they can't speak Arabic. These women can't speak French, and like the social function of a mistress in France at this time is also things like 
going to parties and having sparkling conversations and, you know, being like little teasing and stuff like that. So they, they find these relationships, even when they can manage to have one, very unfulfilling, and they basically just stop. And they end up scrambling for the few French women there who are already married to other French officers. Uh, if you saw our short on uh, Pauline Forez, Napoleon's Cleopatra, quote unquote, uh, that's a classic example. I do want to mention something about Napoleon and the bubonic plague outbreak. Uh, during that outbreak, he visits a plague, ho plague hospital in Jaffa where he, he picks up uh, soldiers and carries them around. It's, it's a very kind of tender scene of him caring for his men, which is not all that often necessarily with Napoleon. Um, and this ends up being heavily propagandized in oil paintings and things like that. But, you know, he, he genuinely seems to have done it, like, as, a, as a, a mark of respect for his troops, rather than just to say he had done it. I do want to pour some cold water on Napoleon euthanizing troops that had the Black Plague during the retreat back to Cairo. Uh, this happened, it didn't happen all that much, maybe less than two dozen times, and it was always men that were so far gone with plague that they were going to die. They could have left them behind, but then they were probably going to be captured and tortured by... Uh, the cavalry that were pursuing them, which was what was happening to people who got left behind. Um, so this was a humanitarian gesture on his part. I don't really think this speaks to his ruthlessness. I think Napoleon was an incredibly ruthless guy. I'm not a big, I think he's very interesting and I would, I would love to do more about him, but I'm not like a fan of him personally. <laughs> but even, you know, even I am like, a, this isn't a thing. Like, I think this is a, um, especially from a modern context, we're like, yeah, yeah, you euthanize them, right? It's understandable. Also, he did mostly walk back to Egypt with his troops. And in fact, he gives this order like everyone's, everyone walks. And then an officer says, you know, General, would you like to ride this horse? And he literally hits the guy and repeats, everyone walks. Uh, though he does ride a camel at some points. Good thing he got over to the government of France before anyone could talk, ask any awkward questions about what the hell happened back in Egypt. It's the opposite. I mean, he's printing his own newspaper uh, called the, uh, the Courier l'Egypte in, uh, in Cairo and posting it back home and like sent, comes back with a stack of issues of it. And it's putting the absolute best face on the expedition. So he is intentionally propagandizing his expedition to like the crowds back home, which this is a very like French Revolution Enlightenment thing, right? Like everyone is doing this, this self-promotion and Napoleon is particularly good at it. Uh, this, that's how you get these cults of personality in the revolution, where you don't have a royal presence or an aristocratic presence to focus on. So it's who's the best writer, who's the best speaker, who can print the newspapers that are like getting, getting, everyone, um, getting everyone's brains moving and swaying people to your side. So I mentioned Adam ruins everything we learned in school, really glossed over how brutal and messed up the French campaign in Egypt and Syria actually was. Yeah, um, I was really surprised myself, actually. I didn't, I, I wasn't aware of that uh, when I started. My specialty in college was British history, so as far as I know about this period, it's mostly from the British side um, and British colonialism in like India, for example. Uh, but it tracks, like it's similar to things that are happening in India, right? The idea that you come in and you uh, create local allies and sort of divide and conquer strategy, right? Episode five, YouTube question. Fun fact, when Egyptians think about the French invasion, this is uh, a viewer from Egypt, which we had several comments along these lines. It comes with a mixture of feelings because on one side, Napoleon came with the intent to invade Egypt and killed thousands of people in the process. But on the other side, it was thanks to the savants that Egypt industrialized quicker than its neighbors. Yeah, another legacy we don't really discuss is how Napoleon really eradicated a whole generation of scholars in Cairo, which was a big detriment to you know, uh, religious scholarship in the city because the, the Cairo revolts were centered around mosques and universities and a lot of the participants were students and they just get killed. Like when they come into the, you know, when they come into the, the, the Grand Mosque at the same day, Al Azhar Mosque, they end up, you know, killing one number quoted was like 6,000 um, uh, people in that, in that vicinity. So uh, it's a huge blow. Uh, we had another Egyptian viewer that it's surprising to me that even French people who I talked to don't realize how lasting the effect of these three years of French presence were. It's true that Egyptian Arabic possesses a lot of loan words from foreign languages, um, but there are a lot of French words that remain despite a lack of a significant French community in Egypt uh, or a very long time occupation. Um, yeah, there was a French presence in Egypt. There were merchants there for quite a while. 
But yeah, I, I think that's really fascinating. And I, I think that's a legacy of, of this period. Thank you for bringing that up. I didn't know that. Uh, a few people were interested in what the savants were doing and like were the people who were doing these imperial imperialist projects the same people who were doing the science project? Yeah, they were going back and forth because, you know, when they get cut off after the Battle of the Nile, they can't get resupply. They can't get parts they need for things that are breaking down. They can't get uniforms, new uniforms. They're there for years with their uniforms wearing out. So they start taking all these savants and like putting them on these projects of like, okay, I know you've never done any cloth manufacture or anything before, but you need to figure out how we can make new uniforms from local materials. Or, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at digging this canal that's going to eventually, you know, be uh, uh, the Suez Canal, or will later be realized as the Suez Canal. Um, so it, it's, it's funny, it's like, it's going back and forth. So it's not like this scientific project and this imperialist project, they're really enmeshed. Um, by the way, the real reason the balloon caught fire and failed is because they lost the silk balloon in the Battle for the Nile. They lose most of the scientific instruments in the Battle, for, Battle of the Nile. And they remake the balloon out of paper, which doesn't go so great. Someone mentioned that the savants refused to hand over their notes because they knew if they did, the British scientists from the Royal Society would publish them under their own names. There's a wonderful letter saying that uh, the British could either stop demanding the notes or be responsible for burning a second priceless library in Alexandria. Yeah, read Mirage. It's a really good book. Um, another thing I just wanted to mention, they did try and recruit soldiers locally. It wasn't a big success. They got about 150 Mamluk cavalry. Actually, they mostly weren't Mamluks. They were, you know, Greeks and Egyptians and Syrians and things like that. Uh, but they're dressed like Mamluk cavalry, which made such an impression right in the Battle of the Pyramids. Uh, and they are they go back to Europe with Napoleon and they end up, some of them are at Waterloo. They're a really popular subject for painting. There's there's a, a, a sketch of a, uh, a Mamluk soldier saving a wounded uh, French bugler at Waterloo. Um, but though by that time they'd been heavily diluted with European recruits, but they're still wearing the Mamluk stuff. Mamluk sabers, by the way, this starts off a craze in Mamluk sabers around the world. So like U.S. Marine Corps has Mamluk sabers and they'll say like, oh, this is from the Barbary Pirates era. Really, it's just that they were super popular at the time among European uh, militaries in general. So they, they kind of like copy it. We talk about in uh, Crimean War series next, how there is a period where a lot of American military are like cosplaying as the French military. Um, so speaking of which, coming up on Extra History, the Crimean War, we could have done like two or three series on this, um, but it's, it's a, a fascinating conflict. Uh, I think you'll, you'll be interested in it. We try and do it a little differently than you might've seen before. A History of Buddhism, I, I've just finished writing these episodes. Nick's art is amazing. I'm, I'm very excited for that. We might go shoot some footage, footage of the temple later. Uh, Henry Ford, I just finished writing the second episode about his racing days. The, all these interesting things I didn't realize about him, about the, the Ford Motor Company, and his global and uh, American history impact. And a lot of dark stuff, too. Uh, we'll get there. Uh, coming soon, we're going to be voting on our environmental history series. There are a lot of great topics that were sent in. If you would like to request a topic, uh, or vote on topics. You can be part of our Patreon. Uh, the you can you can click the click the cat. Ibn Battuta's side trip. This is a great one. My favorite thing in this series is the French teaching the Egyptians how to make baguettes. And not only is this just kind of funny, but also it, when you start thinking about it, this is actually a thing the French do everywhere where they set up a colony. So if you go to anywhere that France had a significant presence, whether it's Algeria, Vietnam, um, Lebanon, Tahiti, you'll find French bakeries that make really good baguettes there. Um, I mean, even in Hong Kong, there's French makeup, the second largest expat group in Hong Kong. We have a bunch of great French bakeries. Um, the most famous example of this is the Vietnamese banh mi, which uses a French baguette, which uses uh, rice flour as well, which is a you know local adaptation, and it has Vietnamese produce inside it, and French pate. So this is a now globally uh, popular food that comes out of this fusion of French and Vietnamese cuisines. Uh, I think that's always interesting every time I eat one. Thank you very much for joining us. Please join us next time for the Crimean War. See you next time.
What if I told you that Ahmed Ziad Turk, Angela Valenciana, Arkelite Games, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blaine, Kuya Koi, and Skylar Holmes were all legendary patrons? I'm not kidding.